Welcome everyone. Um, welcome to the sixth and the last webinar of Women Major Groups webinar series, SDGs and Human Rights Mechanisms from a Feminist Perspective. This month, we'll look into the interconnections between the SDGs, Human Rights Council, and the Universal Periodic Review. Before we begin, please allow me to um, share some information on accessibility. We will have uh, interpretation in Spanish and French. So please select the language, including English. So if you want to listen to and talk in English, still please select English. Uh, that you'd like to listen and talk in the meeting from the globe sign at the bottom of your screens. There's a globe sign that says interpretation. Please um, select that uh, and select the language you'd like to listen the meeting in. Um, I will be your accessibility coordinator for this meeting. Unfortunately, our dear Andrea is not able to be with us today, uh, but you can always write to me in chat if you have any problems uh, connecting. Uh, good morning, Shanta. Thank you so much for your introductions. If you would like to introduce yourselves, please feel free to do so in the chat as well. Um, and I'd also like to note that um, the meeting is open to our women's major group members as participants but we are recording the meeting as you can see and we'll be um we'll be we'll be sharing it on our youtube channels and on our social media channels the women's major group is a global intersectional feminist collective that spreads throughout the world and our primary mandate is to facilitate and support our members in their uh, advocacy in the UN sustainable development processes, especially at the regional and global levels. So without further ado, please allow me to give the floor to the Women's Major Group Anglophone Africa organizing partner, Buki Williams from Education as a Vaccine. Buki, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Anaz, and welcome everybody. Hopefully you can hear me um, so that I can keep um, going. Great. Thank you. All right, let me switch on my video. Okay. Yes, good afternoon and welcome everyone. Really glad you all could join us to see some friendly faces. I see Susan, I see Claire, I see other few ones. So it's really great to have you all here today. And so as the women's major group um, with the SDGs and UN human rights mechanism, from a feminist perspective, over the past five months, we wanted to highlight the interplay between Agenda 2030 and the human rights mechanisms of the United Nations um, in a way to support and enhance the implementation of the SDGs from a feminist and a human rights-based perspective. We also hope to have increased knowledge and capacity of our members to interact with the UN human rights mechanisms and utilize the SDGs in their advocacy with these mechanisms and also to introduce other rights-based organizations that are working on the um, intersection of gender equality and UN human rights mechanism to our members who may also want to work um, on those intersections as well. And this is the last webinar of the series. And so we will be talking about two very important human rights mechanisms that are not treaty bodies, unlike mechanisms we've talked about in the past five months. Like that. So basically the Human Rights Council and the Universal Periodic Review. We have a really great panel of speakers today who talk about those two different mechanisms and also about their work and experiences in engaging with these mechanisms. And then in the second part of the meeting, we'll have a chance to discuss together how we can utilize both the Human Rights Council and the UPR their mechanisms, the outcome documents for advocacy on gender equality and systems change within all the UN sustainable development mechanisms which is really excited for us because education is a vaccine. Actually, we support from Choice, one of the organizations that will be represented here today. We actually did get to do some work around UPR and also just getting young people involved. So I'm really excited about this conversation and looking forward to learning more how we can continue that kind of work. So our first speaker today is from the Danish Institute of Human Rights. So Sayonara um, Koenig Rice. Um, is a Brazilian human rights lawyer, or Reese, sorry, is a human rights lawyer with passion for and experience in the fields of gender equality, 
Migration, Peace Building and Development. She's currently the Human Rights and Development Senior Advisor um, at the Danish Institute for Human Rights. Previously, she served as a consultant on governance and peace building at UNDP in New York. And among other professional experiences, she has worked as a legal advisor to the Vice President of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. She's been a civil servant with the Ministry of Women Affairs in Brazil, a consultant for SOS Children's Villages in Ethiopia. And she also has a master's degree in human rights and democratization um, from the European Inter-University Center for Human Rights and has worked and studied in countries such as France, US, Italy, Belgium, Ethiopia, and Brazil. So we're really excited to have her today. Um, she's beyond well qualified to talk about this issue. So Sayonara, thank you for joining us today. Are you here? I yes, know you're here. I am but here. Great. Thank you very much, Bucky, for this very impressive introduction of myself. Now I feel very, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you do, because even I was reading it, I was like, wow, this is so impressive, amazing, way to open. Oh and God. so, <laughs> welcome, and we're really glad you could make time for us today. So could you just please tell us um, more about the connections between the Human Rights Council and the SDGs? What are the possibilities for engagement um, with the council? How can feminist organizations utilize the SDGs, the Human Rights Council and UPR processes towards um, gender equality? And of course, if you could also share resources and tools that the Danish Institute on Human Rights has prepared that could be used by the members that would be great. So I know I just put everything together. Feel free to let me know to remind you, but yeah, please take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you also for setting up these slides there for me. Uh, it's, it is really a big pleasure for me to come back um, and to talk about, oh my God, terrible time. We started uh, shouting outside, sorry for that. Let's start again. Uh, but it's, a, it's really a big pleasure for me to talk about this, this topic, which is one of our goals in the Danish Institute for Human Rights in the development department. We're really trying to promote this um, better coordination and cross-pollination sort of say as well between the SDG and the human rights universe. So it's very, very, very interesting to hear as well from the other colleagues who are going to speak on how they are, they are doing that in practice. So just to start with a general introduction about you know, what, uh, what, what is there in the Human Rights Council and which are the mechanisms and possibilities for engagement on, on that. Well, the Human Rights Council was established in 2016. It, uh, no, we, we can go back to the, <laughs> to the previous one, please. Thank you. Uh, so the Human Rights Council started in 2016 and it was uh, established as a replacement for a previous committee that existed on human rights. And one of the, the greatest things that the Human Rights Council has created was the Universal Periodic Review, which I imagine many of you, many of you are familiar with. Um, it's pretty much a body and- I'm sorry, Sayonara, just to, um, sorry to interrupt you, but um, the interpreters are saying you should just slow down a bit. So if you could just slow down a little bit so that they can- <laughs> they could be able to interpret the amazing things that you're saying for our other members we would really appreciate that i i okay. i totally know how that goes i'm a fast talker but yeah <laughs> yes totally busted for how i normally tend to think too fast and speak too fast apologies to the interpreters for that um yeah so the human rights council uh, established the universal periodic review which is an intergovernmental body that was uh, is, is uh, normally composed by 47 member states, which rotate periodically. The Universal Periodic Review is a very unique mechanism for the review of, of human rights in the sense that it uh, reveals all human rights commitments that states have, and it reveals all member states. And one of the main principles of the Universal Periodic Review Mechanism is really to have this place of equality of examination of the status of human rights uh, implementation by all member states. So the member states are reviewed uh, periodically every four and a half years nowadays. And they are reviewed by this uh, working group of the Universal Periodic Re uh, of the of the Universal Periodic Review, which is composed by those forty seven member states that uh, join the Council. 
There we have, um, I think, one, one very striking thing of the universal periodic review process, let's call it UPR from now on, is that differently from what we see in the SDG processes is that it actually has a conducive um, mechanism and structure for accountability on those commitments. So the universal, the, the UPR, you can, um, the, the working group that reviews member states, they analyze the reports that are submitted by the member states, which they call the, the national report on their own efforts to implement the human rights. They also review together with the national report, the reports or a compilation of reports that is submitted by um, independent experts. This includes experts, for example, from the uh, treaty bodies, which I'm sure you have heard about in previous uh, series of this webinar, but also um, from the special procedures and, and other, um, other activities within the Human Rights Council and the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. In addition to those two reports, you also have a compilation of reports from the stakeholders. And those is what most concern uh, the group here in this call, is it includes the reports that are submitted by civil society and submitted by the national human rights institutions, such as the Danish Human Rights, uh, the Danish Institute for Human Rights in our case. So we also submit a report when Denmark is under review in the Universal Periodic Review. So this in itself already provides a very uh, institutionalized mechanism for civil society to input in the implementation and the situation of human rights in their own countries. And this is not loosely taken. Then the states, the member states, those, uh, those conducting the review of the states, they have lengthy sessions, which nowadays I think it's about three and a half hours of a review session with the member state. And they actually discuss and ask questions and address the member state on the review based on those three reports. And they can also pose questions, of course, drawing from the knowledge that was submitted by the stakeholders, including the NGOs. So that's uh, it, it makes it very significant to take part in this process, to be able to have your voice heard during this very comprehensive review. After that, the stakeholders such as NGOs will also have an opportunity to address the member state and discuss the outcomes of that review process once the, 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 the working group has agreed on the outcome. So they will prepare a report based on the discussions, summarizing the discussions, and will also prepare recommendations for the country under review. In that moment, stakeholders will have an opportunity to speak um, and address uh, the, the council uh, in, that, in that context. The member states will then have the opportunity to either accept or note the recommendations that they receive. And based on that, they will be held accountable by the same mechanism in the subsequent years when they review. So if a country has reviewed now, four and a half years later, they will have to report again on which measures they have taken to implement those recommendations that they have accepted and what other actions they have done to improve the human rights situation in, in, in a country. So in that sense, we have an accountability mechanism going on in the UPR that it's quite special in, in that sense. It also addresses countries that are not cooperating with the council, for example. Uh, these are also you know, ways of the UPR and the Human Rights Council to be able to keep track and keep countries accountable for the, their human rights obligations. So this is, it's highlighted there as the main, you know, the main body sort of say uh, in the Human Rights Council and, and very, very unique in that sense. But the council also has three other, um, three other procedures that uh, sort of say that that can uh, help uh, that can help with interaction with member states and other actors but it can also provide for avenues for um for ngos or groups groups of individuals to address the council they, it has an advisory committee that's more of a think tank so it's not really what we are looking for here uh, but it also has a complaints procedure which receives communications from individuals from groups or for and from ngos and tries to address systematic um, systematic patterns consistent patterns of human rights violations gross reliably attested violations of human rights in the countries and then they bring that to the human rights council's attention as well 
And finally, we have the special procedures, which is um, a special mechanism composed by independent, um, independent human rights experts on several topics. So we have more, almost 50 thematic special procedures, which means these individual experts who are um, conducting reviews and, and reporting on the human rights situations on, on specific issues. Many of them, or some of them are is directly related to genders, for example, we have um, a special rapporteur, that's how we call these independent experts, on uh, violence on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity. There are also some other um, special procedures or special rapporteurs on violence against women, on uh, discrimination, on trafficking, particularly for women and children, and so on. So the, the, the result of these special procedures are also recommendations for states to, uh, to address the human rights violations. And I think one of the, one of the very upside of the Human Rights Council um, mechanisms is this very concrete aspect of recommendations and then follow up and then accountability process within this cycle. So maybe if we can go to the next slide and those are, I will go through very, very briefly. These are just to highlight some of the activities that the Human Rights Council has done uh, in the recent years that are connecting to the SDGs. So for example, there is a, a group of, of member states which are called the Group of Friends on Human Rights in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. You can see the logo of some of them there on, on the screen just for reference. And these are countries who are really trying to boost this interaction between Geneva and the New York crowd and are trying to raise the attention to the, um, to the importance of addressing the 2030 agenda and the SDGs within the context of the Human Rights Council. Denmark is, is very engaged in that, in that group as well. So the council has taken a very important step in, pro in promoting this integration between human rights and SDGs by approving this resolution that uh, it's already a second resolution that, um, that establishes the intersessional meetings on human rights and SDGs, as you can see on the screen. There was already three of such meetings and there will be two more in 2020 and 2023. And they are pretty much fostering dialogue and cooperation on SDGs and human rights. And finally, uh, that's the most recent activity going on in the Council on this topic. There is a sustainable recovery pledge that Denmark has promoted and we have already several member states who have signed up. This pledge is going to be launched on the 30th of June and will, um, and through that the states are committing to putting human rights and the sustainable development goals at the center or, of their um, sustainable recovery efforts to build forward better from COVID-19. The other three slides, I'm not going to get into details. It's just- Sorry, Sainer. Am yeah. I? Do you mind just quickly wrapping up? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I will not get into details. It's just, I mean, if these are shared with the with the participants, perhaps they can explore the tools themselves. And those tools are just to facilitate the integration of uh, the SDGs universe with the human rights universe in terms of linking up the SDGs with um, the, the, the human rights instruments that are relevant for it. This is the first one. The second one is linking on the next page is linking the human rights recommendations that I just mentioned with the SDGs. And you can search by your own country or also by groups such as women and girls. And finally, the last one is with the focus on sustainable recovery and bringing up um, resources and rationale around um, the integration of SDGs and human rights, trying to operationalize that pledge to build forward better. So that's it. Thank you very much. Sorry for passing my time. And I look forward no. to the discussion with the others. Yeah, thank you so much. That was very, very engaging. I really didn't want to stop you because you were mentioning some really important things. And you were mentioning the key word, the word we all love, accountability. And, and that's something we've been looking for in the SDG review process and ensuring that countries are actually able to, to learn from the review process and actually take the recommendation seriously. And I think that's something you've managed to highlight through the UPR process, which is really exciting. And I think it's really useful for us as we, as we take on this process. So thank you so much for that. So I'm gonna quickly jump to Nicoletta. Um, Nicoletta Zapile from UPR Info in Geneva. 
Um, they support civil society to advocate with the UPR and use its outcome documents for their national advocacy. So just a little bit about Nicoletta. She joined UPR Info in July 2018 as the program manager. Prior to joining the organization, she worked at the International Commission of Jurists first as development officer and then also as a project officer at the ICJ Global Redress and Accountability Initiative for Gross Human Rights Violation. That's a long name. And she started her career as a journalist and a digital editor of the Global Journal and International Affairs Focus Media Startup based in Geneva. She holds an LLM in International Humanitarian Law from the Geneva Academy of International Humanitarian Law and Human Rights and a master's in international relations with specialized specialization in international law from the university of florence she speaks italian english and french so i'm very jealous of her language skills so nicoletta thank you so much for joining us today you there yes i'm there thank you so much for inviting me fantastic so just to quickly jump to your question which you also have about five to seven minutes to answer. Could you kindly talk us on the connections between UPR and the SDGs, how we can use both of them mutually in advocacy towards gender um, equality and achievements of SDGs. And like we also asked um, Sayonara, tell us what the possibilities are um, and how you support organizations in their advocacy towards the processes to support the achievements for gender equality. That's perfect. That's a uh, very vast uh, arguments, but I'll try to uh, provide with some input, some ideas and some good practices that I hope can be useful for uh, the work of everyone. Uh, just a few words on UPR Info, who we are and what we do. Um, UPR Info is a Geneva-based uh, NGO. And we work with the UPR to promote uh, human rights and we do that by trying to facilitate the access to this very special mechanism that Sayonara has uh, described very in details. And we try to um, support civil society organizations and human rights defenders, but as well as national human rights institutions, or also groups, associations, uh, any member of the civil society who wishes to um, use this mechanism, this human rights mechanism to uh, promote and protect human rights. Um, this is because at first sight, maybe can be uh, seen or considered a bit too technical or a bit too far away because as uh, you may know the UPR, the moment in which a country is reviewed, which uh, the human rights situation of a country is reviewed, this review happens in Geneva. But this is just one moment of the process. Uh, and I'd like to always underline extensively that it's about the process uh, because throughout the different phases of the UPR, civil society can have a huge impact on the review of its own country. This means that as INR was saying, through the submission of reports, through the advocacy work that can be conducted before and after the review, uh, you can use this mechanism to highlight what are the human rights priority in your country and therefore also use it to uh, promote gender equality and all the related issues uh, uh, that are most important or the most um, that cause the most challenges in your country. Already the Human Rights Council um, resolution um, has uh, stated very clearly that uh, the inclusion of a gender perspective should be adopted throughout all the stages of the UPR. So really this mechanism, given its nature, its universal nature to address all sorts of human rights from civil and political rights, to economic, social, and cultural rights uh, is a, a um, great mechanism to include this gender perspective when analyzing, when reporting, when monitoring all the different human rights issues. 
Moreover, as we know, also the 2030 agenda has adopted uh, systematically the need to mainstream a gender perspective. So we have already just in this, uh, uh, let's say, um, on, on this level, a, um, a common objective that is to mainstream um, gender perspective in these two different uh, mechanisms. Regarding uh, women's rights in the UPR, it's, uh, we have to say that through the analysis of the data that we uh, conduct on a regular basis, women's rights are among the top five main issues that are addressed uh, within this mechanism. Uh, for those who are not aware, um, UPR Info has created a, a database of UPR recommendations. I will be sharing with you after my intervention the link so you can have a look at it. And in this database, uh, basically we provide an easy access to all the recommendations that have been uh, issued within the UPR mechanism since its inception, so basically from 2008 up to now, um, you can see all the recommendations that your country has received. We have also a system of um, a menu that has different filters and you can narrow your research so you can narrow it down, for example, to see what are the um, recommendations that are tackling gender related issues and also um, conduct a, um, a researches, combined researches, where, for example, you look for um, women's rights uh, along with, uh, I don't know, um, recommendations tackling the issues of asylum seekers and refugees or access to education or, for example, any other rights. And you can combine the different uh, um, thematics and you can see what are the recommendations that have been formulated to your country when they were when they were made by whom they were made by which state these recommendations were uh, formulated and if your country has uh, has accepted has supported these recommendations that means that has committed to implement to take an action to implement this recommendation or if it has opted for noting them that means that uh, this country the state under review has not committed to implement that specific recommendations in the next four in the four years and a half that incur between a review and another um, all, like as I said, the recommendations that are tackling women's rights are one of those uh, issues that are more common in the UPR recommendations. Uh, however, we've seen that there are some issues linked to all these recommendations that have been formulated. Some of them are um, quite general. That means that uh, they uh, don't provide a, a specific action. They do not recommend a specific action to the state. And this is, let's say, a missed opportunity because the UPR is really a mechanism that uh, has, is based on the uh, principle of cooperation and with the aim of sharing good practices among states. So when a country makes a recommendation to another country, it's, uh, it's a good practice to make specific recommendations in order to suggest how to um, solve or sort out or improve a certain human rights challenge. Um, another challenge that we have seen. There are three. That Sorry, Nicola, I yes. hate to interrupt you, but can you start wrapping up? Sure. Another two challenges that I've seen that from our work are that um, sometimes women are not, are the recommendations tackling women are not tackling just women, but they're tackling women along with other groups, vulnerable groups. And this undermines a bit the legitimacy of rights holders. And the third challenge that we have seen is that um, some um, recommendations um, tackling uh, gender related issues are brought to cause just when they tackle women's rights. Whereas, as I said in the introduction, it's important to apply a gender perspective 
uh, when analyzing, when monitoring, when reporting on all human rights. So whether I'm talking about the rights of a det detainees or the access to water or access to health, a gender perspective should always be applied. To conclude, uh, one recommendation that UPR Info does always to all the stakeholders with whom we, um, we do capacity building activities or events is that uh, to uh, formulate, to suggest in the advocacy work or in the reporting work that you do uh, when you engage with the UPR basically, always to formulate specific recommendations, adopting the SMART methodology, that is to make recommendations specific, measurable, achievable, um, relevant and time bound. To make them smarter, we also encourage uh, civil society uh, representatives to reference specifically to sustainable development goals and in addition and even more specific to specific uh, to the targets identified by SDGs because that adds um, a, a reference term that can be very useful especially in the phase of implementation of these recommendations. I conclude with that, but then if you want to uh, have examples on this type of recommendations uh, or of, uh, let's say, uh, good practices from countries, uh, I'm happy to reply to your questions after in the question and answer session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicoletta. I know we never have enough time to go over all of this really important information, but thank you for being able to put some really good things in such a short period of time. So really love what you said in terms of it's about the process, right? It's not just about the, the report, like you said, in Geneva, it's really about the process and how we all engage in the process and really about just making smart recommendations because often the recommendations can be so general and then really, really appreciated, you know, the idea of the gendered perspective and really just wanted to say yes to that point about always putting women and youth, women in marginalized groups, women in vulnerable groups who just never get to, address women's issues on its own and I think that's really an important thing to, to note so thank you for sharing that and also the resources that exist with EPR in goal so running on time um we are going to jump to the next speaker so I'm um, going to call on Gabrielle de Lille who is here right I'm here fantastic um hi Gabrielle um, he is a senior program officer at um, IL ILGA World, working on the United Nations Human Rights Council and Un Universal Periodic Review. He holds a master's degree in international law from the State University of Rio de Janeiro and a bachelor's degree in law from the Federal University from Juiz de Fora. His master's thesis was focused on the prohibition of discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity in international law, a topic in which he has authored a number of articles, book chapters, and a book. Um, Gabriel worked as an intern at ILGA World in the UN Advocacy Program, Human Rights Council and UPR for one year, having supported the campaign for the renewal of the independent expert on SOGI. So before joining the organization as an officer, he worked at local LGBTQI organizations, at legal clinics for asylum seekers and migrants, and at a business and human rights center, and taught university degree courses related to international human rights law and LGBTQI rights in Brazil. So we're really excited to have you welcome again. So we're just gonna quickly ask you, um, and we're gonna give you about five minutes for this, which I know is not enough, but we hope we can at least pick up some key things from that. Could you kindly let us know about the tools and resources your organization provides for its members um, in engaging in the UPR mechanism? What tips can you give our members for engagement with UPR? Um, we know that those experiences and tools can definitely be very beneficial for us. So we look forward to you sharing. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here today. Uh, and it's also great to talk after Sayonara and Nicoletta there had provided an overview of the mechanisms. Um, so I'm just going to go a little bit more in details of uh, our work. So Ugo World is an association of more than 1,600 organizations around 150 countries. 
Um, and we do have this, uh, the UPR program, uh, which have been running for already six years now. Um, and as Nicoletta highlighted, we also see it as a process. So we also supported our members organizations in all these stages of the, of the UPR process. So we starting with data collection and to the drafting of uh, written submissions to the UPR uh, advocacy here in Geneva and the uh, follow-up and implementation of recommendations. Um, our main resource regarding this, uh, it's available in our website, which is our UPR toolkit, uh, the SOGESC toolkit, uh, which I can send the link afterwards. Uh, and one thing that you will notice in this toolkit is that we do recommend uh, every organization engaging with UPR on uh, SOGS or LGBTI issues uh, to use SDGs as one of the frameworks in the submissions. Um, and I think it's worth to highlight that, of course, Yuga works specifically on LGBTI issues, which at the UN are still seen as controversial issues. Uh, and using the SDGs has a uh, added value because uh, we know that not all the countries recognize all the international uh, convenience uh, and don't recognize some human rights mechanisms while the SDGs are a bit broadly recognized. So we do see a value of using this language to as an entry point uh, for some states that uh, don't want to use it, the, the traditional human rights language. Uh, and of course, we do see a lot of the exchange also of the SDG sides using the human rights language and both frameworks strengthening each other. Um, and of course, the UPR, it's one of the ideal for us to do that because it's, it, it's the scope, it's very broad and universal. Um, and so what we recommend to our member states, it's really to use all the, the normative frameworks possible. So like from hard law to soft law, and in our case, the Jojo Carter principles and the SDGs. Um, while we can connect a lot of the existing uh, LGBTI recommendations to the SDGs, um, uh, uh, currently we have around 3050 LGBTI recommendations over the three cycles of the UPR. Uh, we have very, very few recommendations that expressly mention the SDGs. Uh, so in our internal data, we, I, I found two recommendations only that, that actually mention the SDGs uh, on the text, which, is a recommenda which are recommendations made by the Netherlands and by Switzerland. Uh, so we do see that there is space for improvement in this and like, and that's something that in the process we can support. So like the work that Yuga does and uh, UPR Info also does is like always, always providing states on inputs, like how your recommendations can be useful to, to the local defenders. Uh, and we try to put this language there, which is not always accepted, but we keep doing this work. Um, and while the, most of the recommendations can be connected to, uh, to SDG 5 and 10, we do see that there are many other SDGs that can also be used. Um, our colleagues from New York, uh, they formed the LGBTI stakeholders group, which is very active on the uh, high level political forum. And they always bring like very comprehensive papers linking all the SDGs to LGBTI issues. So for those interested, I would recommend you to, to take a look at that. And we have also been seeing this being mainstreamed into other, other human rights mechanisms. So for instance, as Sayonara mentioned at the beginning, we do have in the council, the independent expert on SOGI. Um, and one of his upcoming reports is going to be on the relation of the right to health and the SDG3 and uh, SOGI issues. Uh, so we do see that this is becoming more and more common also in the human rights council. So for instance, now we are going to have a resolution that uh, bring SDGs in the title, which is going to be on the state's response to the COVID-19 recovery. Um, and I think that it has become a common practice to always have like one paragraph on SDGs in the Human Rights Council resolutions. Um, and yeah, I think that I reached my time and I'm going to stop here and happy to take any questions afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. You like hit it right at the time I was going to be like, can you start wrapping up? And you just like hit it. 
Powerful. Well done. Thank you so much um, for doing that. And all right, so I really just, uh, you know, appreciate in terms of you just talking about using SDGs um, as a critical framework to discuss some of the issues, because I think um, that that's something that looking at it as an entry point is such an important conversation starter, because often we feel like, ah, the human rec um, mechanisms are, you know, stronger compared to the SDGs, but really, looking at that linkage and actually seeing it as an entry point, I think is really important, especially for those of us who work in countries that are always on the wrong side of history many times. So for, for Nigerian uh, advocates, I think this is actually really an important point and I'm sure for other countries as well. So thank you so much for that. All right, trying to get more in. So now I'm gonna call on Estelle Wagner. Estelle, are you there? Yes, so I am. Fantastic. Hi, Estelle. Welcome. Okay, so um, many of you probably know her from years of advocacy in the SDGs and CSW spaces from the IPPF Geneva office. Um, she's a passionate advocacy professional with expertise in advocating for human rights, especially SRHR, in intergovernmental spaces at the United Nations, both in New York and Geneva. She's skilled in human rights analysis, advocacy strategy development, writing and public speaking. She has significant experience in coordinating and supporting civil society in international regional advocacy spaces. She holds a JD focused on international human rights and is fluent in English and Spanish. So welcome again, Estelle. And you have about five minutes um, to just quickly share with us um, IPPF's work with both of the mechanisms for with SDGs and UPR, and any tips and possibly you know possible support from members and how feminist organizations can connect their work, you know, um, in those processes with the with the SDGs. So. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's really nice to be here on a panel with a lot of colleagues that I work with on a regular basis, um, and to be back again with the Women's Major Group, who I worked really closely with um, when I was at IPPF based in our New York UN office. So just for those of you who don't know IPPF, um, we are a federation working with locally owned autonomous NGOs in over 140 countries. We call those member associations because they're members of the federation, even though they're um, independent organizations. And they provide sexual and reproductive health services and also advocate for legal and policy change to advance sexual and reproductive rights using a human rights based feminist approach. So we conceive of our approach as locally owned but globally connected and that describes our approach to international advocacy as well. So the way that we do our UPR work is that we reach out to those who are um, coming up in the next session support them as they need to submit. Um, their civil society report um, and then support them to work with the UPR info, which does the um, pre-sessions, which are always extremely well attended um, and really well respected by the member states. And then try to, in a pre-COVID world, arrange one-on-one -on -one meetings with um, as many missions as we can in Geneva. It's usually around 20 to 25. But in the current world, we've tried to do that um, uh, virtually online. And one of the key things that we always tell people is that even if, you know, whether or not your travel is possible, um, it's really useful to reach out to embassies that are based in your country. Because when governments are going to make a recommendation to your country, they draw information to inform those recommendations from their embassy in your country. So it's really great to identify you know, key partners in your region, um, maybe key donor governments, um, other kinds of partners that have embassies in your country, send your information to them, and then also send it to the mission in Geneva. And usually those, those email addresses are just available online. You can just send it to um, care of the human rights expert. Um, another key thing that we always want to reinforce with our member associations is that this doesn't need to be additional work. So you already, you don't need to be an expert in human rights. You don't need to be an expert on how the UN works. You are an expert on your context and you work every day and in communities and in your country and you see what challenges people are facing. 
And that is what the missions in Geneva um, and in their capitals, they don't have that information. And it's incredibly valuable to them to be able to inform this, um, to inform their recommendations. So you don't need anything extra. You already are an incredible expert. Um, and so it's just about communicating what you do, what challenges you see, and what you think needs to change to the embassies and then the missions in Geneva. The reason that we think, and, and in many places you will hear that the UPR is sort of the most effective mechanism in the UN, and that's because it's a peer review mechanism. So that means every single country gets reviewed and every single country can make recommendations to that country. So they're on stage in front of all of their peers, countries wanna look their best, and it's a chance, um, depending on your country, it can be more critical and more constructive, but we generally find that sort of a combo approach is the most effective to say, the government has been you know, making these attempts to do things, we really appreciate that. Here's where we think um, they can improve. And as experts in this area, we can support them in implementing these recommendations. And that's something that member states love to hear because that means that, that there's really likely to be implementation and follow-up because they have guidance from civil society on the ground. So for us, the UPR is all about the importance of local authors, local communities, explaining to the global stage what they're facing um, and having them those concerns listened to. And we do everything we can to connect and share that information as much as possible, and then to follow up on that. So it's not just going to the UPR and it's not just the actual event, but then once those recommendations have been made, it's, it's talking to your government to encourage them to accept those recommendations and then talking to them about how you can help them implement that. Um, and a lot of these can be, you know, you can tie them to the SDGs because those are such an important thing on everyone's agenda. Um, but you can also tie them to other processes like the Nairobi ICBD plus 25 process, uh, Beijing, COP, um, any of these international uh, commitments that have been made, you can tie those to UPR recommendations and it becomes an additional um, accountability tool. When it comes to the Human Rights Council, it's very Arisa, similar. Can you just start wrapping up? Yes, I can. Thank so when you. it comes to the Human Rights Council, it's a similar process in that we try to ensure that the priorities that our, country, that our member associations work on in the field and in communities are the things that we are raising to member states in Geneva. And it's something that you don't need someone in Geneva to do as long as you are um, getting information from um, about what, what negotiations are happening at the Human Rights Council, you can reach out to your government and share what priorities you see in your country and that you would like them to prioritize in terms of input, because then they send instructions to Geneva to include that. So I think I will stop there. And again, thank you. And I will be happy to talk about this much more. <laughs> Thanks, Estelle. I think we're going to definitely have time for questions for you all. So if you have points you didn't get a chance to make because I rudely interrupted you, um, you were definitely going to have time to be able to do it because I just wanted to make sure, you know, we have time to get questions from people since this is really um, learning, really getting tips in, in terms of that. So just quickly to before I introduce the next speaker, everyone, if you have questions, please put it in the chat in the Q&A. Be ready with all of your big, big questions because we have some experts here who are ready and willing to answer and provide their expertise. So please do so. Really thank you for those tips in terms of embassies in countries, reaching out to those um, in our countries who can definitely um, push some of our key things. And I, I love you mentioning that it's not additional work, right? We're experts, we don't have to know all of the technical language, all the big language. You just need to be able to say, this is what is happening in our context. And, and, and adding to what Nicolette and Sana and everyone has said, it's just really key recommendations and being able to push that forward. And I think that is so, so, so important. And really just talking about the effectiveness of it. Because like one of the questions that's gonna come up is really around like, how come the SDG review is not as effective as this, this one? you know and i think that would be something important to discuss um as well really want to quickly say thank you to gabriel who had to drop off um he had other engagements but was willing to give us this time so i really want to say thank you gabriel we appreciate you coming in and, and really sharing your knowledge with us 
And on that note, so that we can have enough time for questions and I can start talking, I am going to hand over to, oh, I have lost my document. Hold on, give me a quick minute, y'all. <laughs> Back in business. All right, so now I'm going to introduce our last speaker, but not the least, um, Quirin Len Lenke. Sorry if I pronounced the last name wrong. Um, she's from Choice for Youth and Sexuality. Um, she's an advocacy coordinator there. It's a youth-led SRHR organization based in Amsterdam, Netherlands. This year, she was the Dutch um, NGO representative to, the, to CSW. She has an academic background in sociology, um, both bachelor's and master's, and is an avid queer and sex worker rights advocate. Before her position at Choice, she worked as a local LGBT policy advisor and consultant on local and national sex uh, work policy in the Netherlands. Her first visit to the UN was during the intergovernmental negotiations for the SDGs in 2015. So we are really glad to have you here. Thank you for joining us. I, I think you're here. I saw you pop up. Oh, there you are. Yeah. Great. So um, we've heard very inspiring work of advocates of some advocacy today and some great tips on human, the Human Rights Council and the UPR processes and how it can be used to further advocacy on SDGs and, 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 and vice versa and things like that. But could you just give us more info um, on what um, choices work around the connections between the Human Rights Council and the SDGs and how you use both in your work? And, you know, like we've been asking everyone, share some tips with us and how we can utilize all of these processes, SDGs, Human Rights Council, UPR, um, to support the achievement of gender equality. And you have about seven minutes. To, to be able to share with us. Yes, definitely. Uh, thank you for having me. And also thank you to all the other speakers and the attendees listening in today and sharing questions. Um, if you could please uh, start sharing my uh, presentation. So I'll start by introducing uh, CHOICE. For those of you who are unfamiliar with us, uh, CHOICE is a youth-led SRHR organization uh, based in the Netherlands. Uh, we advocate for youth SRHR, but also for the meaningful participation of young people on all levels of decision making. Um, and in doing so, we are active both at the UN in New York and in Geneva, so both with the development and human rights processes uh, that the UN knows. Is everything working with it? Yeah. Apologies. Great. I think this is a PDF, so this is as good as it gets for me. Okay. It's okay. Yeah, sure. Uh, please, next slide. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, we work uh, with the CSW, but also the CPD and the HLPF in New York, and uh, with all these uh, mechanisms in Geneva. And in doing so, we try to advocate for progressive norm setting and inclusive language around youth SRHR, or simply preventing uh, a backslide. Um, but besides, we also try to broker the UN system itself, trying uh, what we can do with the offices behind certain processes or mechanisms and trying to make it more youth friendly and inclusive. Um, and we also build the capacity of other youth to engage in these high level spaces and for all of this to happen in a, in a youth friendly or entry level friendly way. Next slide, please. So um, when I got this question, I thought, okay, why are the SDGs important? And I think that the previous speakers already uh, indicated that it can be an important hook for other issues. Um, and that's also what I thought. It's um, a, a process that knows a certain history. It's, it's not completely new. It builds on the Millennium Development Goals, uh, but there is a shift in, um, well, in how it's received, basically, the SDGs are more of a global agenda. And although it might not really be felt as a truly global agenda as it should be, uh, this is definitely something that is important to continue to stress that everyone has a responsibility uh, to implement and to commit to the SDGs to achieve uh, the goals. 
the voluntary reporting on the implementation of the SDGs, which happens through the voluntary national uh, uh, reviews, is state-led, but voluntary. Um, however, we've seen a consistent number of states uh, committing uh, uh, to this and submitting VNRs every year. And also the major groups and other stakeholders are involved in the HLPF. And this is a very important point because it is one of the other spaces in the UN that we are present. So we can listen to what states are saying, even though the presentations are often um, overly positive and uh, also very short and with limited um, access for civil society to make interventions. But it is a space where we can listen in and we can review also, the, of course, the reports that uh, states are submitting. And besides that, the Sustainable Development Goals have a few uh, hooks that are particularly relevant for SRHR, already mentioned was SDG 3, for example, but of course also SDG 5 and many other interlinkages. Next slide, please. So human rights are also part of the SDGs. It's part of the underlying guiding principles of the Sustainable Development Goals. And of course, the well-known slogan, leaving no one behind, uh, which is not always practiced and not always visible in the text, not at all, actually, especially if we look at Sergesk issues, but also around youth, for example, not everyone sees themselves reflected in the texts of the SDGs, but also in other human rights documents. And um, within the Geneva space, uh, Joyce has felt that there is a little bit more room somehow to, um, to be a bit more progressive and where Sergiesk is becoming, well, increasingly accepted might be too positive of a way to put it, um, but there is room. Um, and these principles are interlinked. For example, there is no resilient society without women's empowerment um, and there is no uh, human rights-based approach possible without focusing on accountability. Next slide, please. So the SDGs uh, provide us with a few opportunities as advocates. It is a well-known mechanism, both for a more general audience as of course for, uh, for the international forum. So it is a conversation starter. Um, the use of the VNR, uh, it can be used in, in, the, uh, in your shadow reporting towards the UPR, or you can take the SDGs up in the recommendations that you, um, through a smart methodology, um, hope that states will, will give through a UPR uh, recommendation. And if states have committed to the SDGs, then you can assume that they have committed to a certain issue and you can, um, um, you can hold them accountable as such. So the issue you can uh, bring up in the UPR shadow reporting and um, this whole, yeah, Poppercast, we call it in Dutch, um, the international circus, it sometimes feels very uh, not so pragmatic and very um, overly positive what states are sharing about their own efforts. And I see uh, a lot of uh, critique towards the HLPF, for example, uh, rightly so. But since we're there and since states are being so positive about their own efforts, we can use that to our advantage on a regional or local level and hold them accountable. So uh, the SDGs provide a bridging potential as well between the New York processes and the ones in Geneva. Next slide, please. So as choice, we also observe uh, some of the trends that we see going around. Um, and around the SDGs, um, I'm sure that you've also seen, uh, seen them, there are a lot of uh, complot theories around the Great Reset, uh, the World Economic Forum, building back better as a term is becoming very controversial. Um, and even the SDGs itself. Um, if you haven't heard of it yet, that's great. At least here, on, even on a national level in Parliament, it's, it's bizarre how this is being framed currently. Um, Climate change denial is another issue that we'll also face uh, likely during next year's CSW. The sustainability or environmentalism fatigue in society and among politicians is also more and more noticeable, we feel. 
Um, and besides that, of course, the, the gaps, the, the leaving no one behind, which is not practiced enough and not everyone being reflected in the texts. So sometimes it is wise to not depend on, uh, on other mechanisms such as the, the SDGs, but to stick strictly to, uh, to the issue itself, unfortunately. Um, but the Geneva mechanisms are very fit for accountability. Uh, I think Estelle already mentioned it, that it's probably uh, the most effective one because it's peer review. And yes, yeah, states listen better to other states than to us. That's unfortunately the case. Um, and what we've also seen in guiding other young people and working with other organizations uh, in the Geneva space is that it's much less crowded than the space in New York. So there is room for new ideas, room for uh, linkages. So I think that we can really make an effort to make the, the bridging effort between Geneva and New York and the SDGs can be a way to do so. Um, and as a general tip, uh, this goes for smart recommendations, this goes for outreach to offices behind UN processes, but anything. I think the best tip that I've gotten is that diplomats like to be spoon fed. So if you take this into account and um, let the SDGs help you in doing so, then I'm sure that we can uh, strive for more positive change together in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Karin, for a very colorful and, and beautiful presentation. And of course, special place in my heart um, as a youth-focused organization um, for a youth-friendly systems change and including young people and not leaving them behind and really mentioning them in your presentation and keying them in. So really appreciated that. And I think it was really very useful, a lot of the points that you highlighted as well. So thank you so much. So I'm not going to talk um, too much because I want to jump to the discussion because that's what we were trying to make time for. And I think we have a decent amount of time to be able to do that, which is always exciting because most, most webinars, you're like, the end, sorry, we only have time for one question. So I think we made it possible today that we have quite a, you know, we have a few minutes for questions and also for um, discussion and also for our panelists to also share things that I might have cut them off from saying that they wanted to highlight. So I think we have time for that. So, um, so far, I only see one question on the chat. So I will call on her to, you know, pose the question if she wants to. So Gabrielle, I don't know if you're there, if you would like to just ask your question direct instead of having me read it out, because y'all might be tired of my voice. So maybe we need a different voice to, you know, ask a question this time. So I don't know if you're there. Yes, I'm there. Can you see me? Yes. All right. So please ask your question. I think it's very much about this disconnect that Kirin just mentioned between Geneva and New York. And when we look at the HLPF process, it's really a green, blue, black washing, whatever you want to call it, of all the human rights violations, including gender justice violations. Um, whereas in the Geneva process, obviously, it's a lot more in depth. So I already see one response, we should boycott the HLPF. I don't, you know, is that tactically a good move? Is that politically something reasonable? Or conversely, how could we get the UPR and other findings into the VNR reporting of the countries? Thank you. Thank you. So before I go back to our panelists, because she gave that, that was a big question. She didn't even like let you all relax. She just, you know, gave you a, a big question. That so I'm going to give you a few minutes to, you know, to think on that and reflect a little bit on it and see. Do we have Do we have any other questions? Would anyone have questions they would like to raise to ask our panelists or clarifications um, they would like to to raise? Oh, okay. So if you are still thinking, I would just add um, also, oh, okay. And then Yemisi, do you want to ask your question out loud? You can unmute and ask, or I can ask it for you. 
Um, she mentioned great sessions. What can we do to make the Nigerian government accountable? Um, and how do we make sure, you know, to leave no one behind a reality uh, in terms of that? And for me, my question that I'm going to throw in there as well is that, you know, you all have shared um, some processes and things, but I, I was actually looking, wanted to see if you all had any examples in, in terms of what looks like a win, you know, in combining these processes. So do, is there any example that you could share that you've seen in like a particular process, either on SOGI, on women's rights, on, on climate change, that really was something that was unexpected that we had been pushing for. And then through the UPR process, we got some governments to give some strong recommendations and that the country responded and was like, okay, we'll, we'll try and fix that or we'll try and, and do that. Um, so I would be curious if you have any examples in some of the advocacy that you have done that you could count as a win that we can take with us um, in, in being able to use these processes. Because sometimes I think we get, we get exhausted, right? Especially with everything that's been going on with COVID, the issue of vaccine equity, you know, and all of these things, I think it's really important to see like when these processes work. So if you all don't mind sharing, um, that would be great. So I think we can work our way, um, starting from the beginning again. So we bring in Nicoletta, who's gotten a chance to, to view and rest and listen to other, to other um, presentations and if you all also want to discuss or highlight some of the things other people have shared it would be great so Nicolette I'm gonna hand over to you you can definitely pick and choose because it's a free world which questions you want to answer and then yeah let us know which ones you want to answer and then I'll go to the next person okay may I just give a small short answers to my perspective to the different questions that we had go for it okay <laughs> Okay, first uh, uh, from Gabrielle, thank you for your question. Yes, I know that sometimes the idea is just uh, leave the things, but actually I would say boycotting, it's never, not never, but in this case, I don't think it's uh, maybe the right solution. Uh, I know that there is not enough space in the HLPF forum to um, uh, to have an impact, especially as civil society. There is not that space as we have in the UPR mechanism, but this does not mean that the HLPF cannot improve in the next years in the sense that um, we have seen in some cases that good practices um, can be shared also from one world to the other, from the human rights world to the development world. So maybe like in the future, if we continue to stress the fact that uh, there is no space for civil society to engage in the HPL forum, or the fact that there is no space to integrate uh, in, in an inclusive manner, a human rights discourse, uh, um, things could be adapted and they could get, for example, some good practices from the UPR and adapt into the HGLPF forum. At the same time, we need to continue to make these links in the UPR as well, uh, because in this way, we, um, let's say, make the states uh, more and more familiar with the overlaps that exist between the human rights and the SDGs, so that we uh, like we continue like uh, a drop to show yes we're tackling human rights, but actually this uh, human rights issue is uh, linked uh, excessively with this target. So you cannot hide behind this fact. So I would say. No, let's not uh, <laughs> lose our hopes on that. Regarding how governments can be accountable, in this case, the question was specifically regarding Nigeria government, but it's something that can be extended to all the governments. How do we make them accountable? Um, one way, I, the, something that we always repeat is that the um, reporting for the HLPF forum, as well as uh, the UPR, they are just uh, like there are processes. So the work has to be done on a regular basis and alone it's more difficult. This means that it's important that um, uh, different sectors of civil society work together. By that, I mean that civil society organizations, human rights defenders, not only are encouraged to uh, make um, coalitions, uh, create partnerships among them in order to be able to cover more extensive 
comprehensively or to give a space to the different vulnerable groups or to the different um, voices that otherwise will not be heard. I especially refer to those that uh, maybe uh, a lot of NGOs, a lot of associations do not have the expertise, the knowledge of how uh, international human rights mechanism works. So it's important that the ones that have this expertise bridge make like uh, get um, uh, collect the information, the voices, the experiences, the challenges that local grassroots organizations face, and they bring this uh, like to the international level and then back to the national level. And back to the national level, it's extremely important to inter um, include in this discourse parliamentarians, national human rights institutions, because they can be very strong allies. I will leave the national human rights institutions because we have Sayonara that is here, maybe she wants to give some inputs, but I want to stress the importance of including parliamentarians in updating them on your work, on the reports that you give, on the, on the review that your country has, because sometimes parliamentarians are not aware uh, about these mechanisms, and they are the ones that actually can introduce the human rights debate uh, in the parliament. They are the ones that can decide budget allocation to uh, give to certain uh, policies and to not only change the legal national framework, which is very important, but the amendment of uh, the national legal framework with international norms is just the first step because then uh, there are policies that needs to be developed to make that laws uh, fruitable for everyone, to make them concrete. And last, to conclude uh, with the concrete example that uh, uh, Buki was asking. So for example, okay, I don't want to get the wrong mistake, but in Mongolia, um, if I'm not mistaken, after the UPR review, one of the recommendations that the country received was for, uh, to give a special attention on the rights of women and girls with disabilities, including their reproductive rights, in the sense that before the uh, second cycle review of Mongolia, um, if I'm not mistaken the timing, but uh, there was this case that women with mental disabilities did not have their decision on the um, on uh, the uh, decision of abortion or um, sterilization and that that decision was exclusively mandated to the medical staff. Um, with UPR recommendations that were inputted by civil society and then these were picked up by recommending state, this means that a recommendation was made during the interactive dialogue. Uh, this recommendation was actually um, accepted by the government of Mongolia. After the review, um, civil society continued to stress this program and thanks to the um, cooperation with UNFPA. So here we have another actor. It's not a national actor, it's an international actor, but the local agencies of UNFPA helped the ministry to revise um, uh, the guidelines of the national law and to adapt them to the international um, standards. And following that collaboration, um, the, um, the, uh, the law that was uh, the provision of the abortion services for women that had mental disabilities was revised. So in that, um, since that moment, women uh, need to give their consent or uh, to have that procedures. And trainings were then held with um, the health professionals in order to uh, Put in practice uh, the um, what had changed at the legal uh, at the normative uh, level. So this is just uh, an example, but there are many others where you see the collaboration of civil society before and after the review in collaboration with uh, UNFPA in this case. But it can end the parliamentarians because the law was changed, and then uh, the trainings that were held with the health professionals that are the ones that then were applying the law. And with that, I leave you. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Nicoletta. I really appreciate um, all of those really key points. So I'm going to go to Sayonara. Sorry. Um, yes, you're here, right? You are there. I'm, I'm here. Great, fantastic. So I'm going to um, hand over to you to answer some of those questions. I don't know if you need me to repeat um, some of those, but there's also one that came in. So punt it to you. Um, looking also at Nigeria and other African countries and also other countries. Um, thinking of the, the African peer review mechanisms, I don't know if you have any comments or statements on that and if it's working and if there's potential for that. And Martha also just 
Um, ooh, I think she just kind of made a comment that most governments are very reluctant to share information or educate their governments. Um, so no work on their side in terms of the SDGs, which makes it let make which makes them less effective. So there's intentional work that's needed uh, to be able to ensure the applications of the of the different agendas. Yes, thanks for that, Martha. So I'm going to give every person because we're kind of running out of time. Three minutes to wrap up. So I will hand over to you, um, Sayonara, and then we'll go to Estelle, and then we'll end with Corinne. And then we'll try to wrap up. So go ahead, ladies. OK, so just very briefly to those great questions. Um, I think, I, I mean, first I wanted to address as well Gabrielle, Gabrielle's uh, concern about, you know, is it even worth it? And that is coming from a national human rights institution who had to even have that question in the very beginning is, why would we involve with the SDGs when we already have the human rights process there and much providing for much more accountability? And I think that, I mean, one of, one of the answers goes in the direction of the energy resources and visibility that comes with the SDG processes, um, which we could find an entry point, a unique entry point, sort of say, to work with many actors and actually go into some of the, the, the points in the, in the very last question there in the chat of using the SDGs as an avenue to advocate and to educate on human rights issues. And that is because, I mean, from our own analysis and what you can, see, can see on our databases as well, the SDGs and human rights are not two different things, but they do provide for two different spaces for advocacy, for, um, for uh, knowledge sharing and, and so on. So we do see that, uh, that opportunity there as a bit as Nicoleta said as well in trying to, you know, then we thought the, the, the best thing we could try to do is to provide tools that facilitate this connection so that it doesn't, I think as Estelle mentioned, so that we don't need to be experts in both things, but that we can actually find ways of easily just plugging in the information from one to the other and be able to maximize our spaces for accountability in both, uh, in both avenues and also take advantage of that stage that the SDGs provide with the HLPF, that energy of those you know, 4,000 people in New York and so on. So there is a certain advantage there as well. Um, we would really recommend that you use the recommendations from the, the human rights bodies and mechanisms as uh, the kind of authoritative arguments when you are also discussing in the HLPF so that you can refer specifically to recommendations that were addressing key issues. For example, recommendations can be as, as specific to talk about, you know, the country should improve the le this uh, legislation number one, two, three in this direction. So using that to bring to the discussion of the HLPF as, as concrete as possible. Um, and one, I think um, we are seeing very positive developments uh, concretely as well in this effort of making this integration. And one of them has been the fact that national human rights institutions, which are still um, an underutilized institution at national level, uh, widespread in the SDG processes, are starting to become involved in there, which also means that they bring that you know, baggage and, and knowledge and accountability to those processes as well, including through the provision of data and statistics that they do for the UPR process, for the treaty bodies, into the review of the, of the SDGs as well and the VNRs. So we are also fostering data partnerships in that sense to be able to bring that element into um, the review of the SDGs and improve some accountability there as well. And I'm, I reached my time book. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that. Very, very helpful, very useful. So I'm just quickly going to jump to Estelle so I can give you all your three minutes to be able to cover things. So Estelle? Sure, I'll, I'll start with HLPF. Um, when they were negotiating the SDGs and the 2030 agenda, there was a whole debate on the word accountability. And the point was made by number, numerous countries that states aren't accountable to each other. They're only accountable to their own citizens. So the HLPF was never designed to be an accountability mechanism as much as that's sort of what it's touted to be. Um, and I completely understand the frustration because meaningful civil society is completely absent from the HLPF. 
unless you have a government which is already committed to civil society participation and including them in writing their national reports or their delegation, it's really hard for civil society to participate in the BHLPF at the international level. However, I think at the national level, in the report writing, in the there should be, they are advised to have civil society consultations on that, that report. There is, there is the chance for civil society to be engaged at the national level. I always think of the HLPF kind of as like the global beauty pageant, but the process of a government writing that report, that does provide an opportunity to reach out to the governments that have to input and ask what they're putting in to see if you can like comment on the draft, asking if they're consulting civil society. And then as some other um, colleagues have mentioned, there are regional and sometimes national bodies where you can also um, engage in more meaningful accountability on, on the HLPF and on, on the SDGs. Um, in terms of good examples, um, there are three that come to mind for me, all of which are kind of related to abortion. Um, our Irish member association worked on every treaty body and the UPR um, to ask for recommendations around the criminalization of abortion in Ireland. Our Mexican association also worked on treaty body uh, engagement and the UPR to look at decriminalization of abortion in Oaxaca. And they, they got recommendations from, from other countries and the government accepted them and that was actually implemented. But that only happened because they were already working on a comprehensive level on campaigns for this at the national level. So they were working with local parliamentarians, they were wor working on all of these other things so that this was just like an extra piece. It was an extra tool in their toolbox of an existing campaign. And the last one I wanna mention is the US. There are two approaches, I think, with the UPR. You can go in knowing your government isn't going to accept this recommendation, but it's important to draw attention to it anyway, or you can go in hoping that you can have a constructive approach and they'll, and they'll accept it. The US went in under the Trump, Trump administration, knowing they were never gonna accept a recommendation on the global gag rule. But then the election happened and the Biden administration came in and they did accept it. So, but that was again, because there was already a massive national campaign to overturn the global gag rule. So my biggest piece of advice, and I'm wrapping up here, is that this, you can reuse, you can readapt the same report for treaty bodies, for the UPR, for the HLPF. You don't have to reinvent it every time, but it does need to be, I think, part of a comprehensive strategy and not just a standalone piece of advocacy, because then you have many different fronts on which you're advancing this. And this is an, these are extra pieces that support that approach. Thank you so much, Estelle, that was great. So, Corinne? Yes, thank you. Um, on boycotting the HLPF, um, I yeah, I understand the sentiment, but I don't think that that's the wisest approach that we can take. Because um, what happens if we leave? Is then the opposition joining in? Uh, are they then the only voice? Uh, so yeah, it's it's. I don't I don't see that as the the solution. Um, of course, we hope that the HLPF can uh, improve in um, uh, in the international space. But indeed, there is so much more that we can do on a regional or uh, national level. Um, in the previous program that I work with, the Right Here Right Now program, um, we've worked with partners who had a lot of trouble reaching out to their government um, who were preparing the VNR report. And yeah, it, of course, it was the year of COVID. So a lot of governments were overwhelmed with COVID response and also gave that as a reason to, um, to either postpone the VNR um, or to not respond to civil society. Um, and some youth advocates also felt that, you know, them being a young person or um, uh, similarly for other marginalized communities, uh, them being from a specific community was an additional reason for them not to have an effective communication on the VNR with their government. Um, and I understand that we want, yeah, we, we have so much work to do and so many people to reach out to, but what really proves to be most effective, and that goes for, um, well, influencing national advocacy, but also the international 
mechanisms, but also the, the report writing around the VNR, is to not wait until the date approaches when your state is likely starts, starts to work uh, on creating the VNR report, but to build and invest in an existing relationship with the people from that ministry or the statistical institute that you know is important or the parliamentarians or the diplomats that you know are engaged with this process and to, to really show them how it can be a two-way street and not just uh, you know, provide your input, but also um, offer to work with them and yeah, well, again, uh, uh, spoon feeding them um, to really make the most out of a collaboration. Um, that can be very difficult, but yeah, investing in a more sustainable relationship with those that you're trying to influence um, is more effective for then when time comes to influence them that they will listen, hopefully. Um, and on, on leaving no one behind, um, I don't think that we'll actually succeed to leave no one behind before 2030, unfortunately. Um, it is very much a data question. Uh, if you're not counted, you don't count oftentimes. Um, so if you know that your community or a certain community that you're advocating for is not counted or is left behind in the implementation of the SDGs or in the data collection around the implementation, perhaps you can influence that statistical happening or you can do your own research and report on your community or on what you're seeing. Um, during the CSW, uh, I had a discussion with the, um, our Minister of Emancipation and she said that in the Netherlands, somehow we are the only country in the world where COVID does not have a gendered impact because the data doesn't show it. And of course, this is not, not true at all, but since they have a specific way of doing their data analysis, it doesn't show up. And so there's no reason to create policy on this. Mm. So then it is crucial that civil society steps in, creates and um, shows their own research to back up the arguments and to push for uh, feminist policy where this is included. Yeah. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Um, I think, okay, um, I'm going to quickly hand over to Shanaz who needs to say something about the interpreters and then I'll quickly wrap up. Just, uh, just a very quick note that our interpreters will need to leave us. Uh, thanking them so much for um, their work in these one and a half hours. We realize human rights and SDGs are the easiest things to interpret, but many thanks for joining us. Uh, so just to let you know, if you can go to off or English, we could wrap up together. Right. So I want to say thank you all so much. I really want to say thank you for um, to our panelists who really shared a lot of information in a short period of time and who made it interesting and engaging that I, I took notes. And I think for all of us, we definitely learned more and we're leaving. And so you made it a, a great final webinar on this particular issue. So I really want to say thank you so much to Sayonara, to Nicoletta, to Estelle, to Kareen and to Simon who's left already. But I really just wanna say thank you so much and thank you so much to all of you who participated, asked questions, engaged, made comments. Really wanna say thank you. Um, thank you to Shinaz and Andrea who you know been at the forefront of coordinating the women's groups OPs to be able to make this a reality. So as we, you know, work towards a, um, HLPF, I hope we can put this you know, into practice, we can try out some of these strategies, try out some of these tips. And so because it's 3.32 and it's time to go, I'm gonna say thank you very much everyone and have a good rest of your Tuesday. Would thank it you. be possible for you to, uh, for us to take a 